We are recording, so uh, this is for the world to see on the World Wide Web and the Internet. We are so thankful and happy to have Dr. Joe Everson here for the, today and the next two weeks. To, and this is very exciting uh, that we are, his new book, just published about a month ago. Three weeks. Three weeks ago. Uh, and this is, a, this is a lot of work. This is a, a lifetime culmination of work in all of, uh, from all the years that you've been working on Isaiah. And he'll, he'll be explaining it to us, but I'm so happy that we um, have these available for you. If, um, and if you, the retail is like 36. Um, we're going to get them at author's price. Uh, so 20, including the book, shipping and handling, $20 each if you'd like to get a copy. This is my copy here. Um, as you see the book, um, as you page through it, you'll see that the whole text of Isaiah is in it, beautifully. This is the new RSV, mm -hmm. okay, and with, uh, you know, commentary with each, with each section of scripture, and then with, and you have a lot of uh, intro, too, of explanation of um, the book of Isaiah, but um, I'm not going to say too much more other than I'm thrilled about this. Thank you for being with us these three weeks, and uh, we look forward to learning more about Isaiah from you. And uh, and then uh, if anybody wants to buy a book, I'll I'll be selling them for you. And uh, do you want to? Should people have them in hand? No. For, okay, just and you have a handout. Everybody's got the handout. Okay. Let's begin with the prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the blessing of having. Dr. Joe Everson here this day and the next two weeks as well. Thank you for this culmination of his work through that came now comes now through his book, his commentary on Isaiah. We pray, Lord, your blessings on it, as many many people will be reading it and studying it and learning from it. Isaiah, so important in the Hebrew Scriptures and for us in our faith. We thank you, Lord, for the the blessings that it is for us and. What appropriate time for us to be studying and reading now through this Lenten season. So bless Joe with your Holy Spirit as he teaches us this day. Help each of us to dig deep and to learn well and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> I'll sit over here and advance okay. the slides. Did everybody get a, uh, one of the three-ring notebook? No, because you can keep your papers in here. Oh. It's easy to take notes. Good morning. I am so pleased to be at Ascension this morning and to receive and Tim and other friends. I look at Deborah and I remember a wonderful trip to Germany together, a Reformation tour, and I remember also being here a year or two ago to talk about. Wittenberg and the bicentennial of Luther's, whatever it was, birth, or no, 95 Theses, I guess it was, and um, what good memories those are. I have been involved with Isaiah now for a good 10 or 15 years, more than that. In fact, the other day I realized my first sermon that I ever preached was 30 years ago on Isaiah 51, and I'll mention that in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, if you'll this is good. the text for me, see if okay. we'll get started here. Okay. Um, Isaiah is a special book in the church. I'll have a slide in a moment that says that there are 27 texts from Pericope Series C. 27 texts we use from Isaiah. You can go to the next text here. And um, it, it shows how often we have used the, the Isaiah. This was the text from an Epiphany. A few weeks ago, arise, shine, for your light has come, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And you say, nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around, they all gather, they come to you. Next, um, your sons shall come, your daughters be carried, the wealth of the nations shall come to you, the multitude of camels will cover you. All those of Sheba shall come, there shall bring gold and frankincense. You just have this feeling of joy among the people, the goodness of life. And that provides the background then for an epistle and a gospel text 
Go ahead, next, next. And, and this is last Sunday's text, the famous uh, benediction on Isaiah 40 to 55. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. You who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine without money and without price. Incline your ear to me and listen so that you may live. That kind of joyous uh, response of the Old Testament lesson. That's last Sunday. Today we've got a Joshua text, but next Sunday, next uh, is, is Isaiah 43, which for me is one of the most enjoyable texts in Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, remembering the refer the um, remembering the Exodus and the passage through the sea. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, bringing out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down; they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember those former things, or consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a but new thing. Now it, now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and deserts and the rivers in the deserts. The, the prophet is concerned that you not just get hung up on the past, but that you understand that God is Lord of the present and the future and can do a new thing. Next. Uh, and this one I added just because it's one of my favorite texts. It's a text that I preached on long ago. Um, I had a horse in junior high. And a friend and I used to ride in the countryside around Zombrota, Minnesota, and we had a quarry that we would visit. And I remember a totally deserted quarry, but that whole rock face with the different layers of sediment. If you've walked in a canyon, you know. This is to say, consider the rock from which you were hewn, and the quarry from which you were digged. Look to Abraham and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, and I blessed him and made him many. How many of us here have ancestors who emigrated, or someone? My, I have three of my four immigrants, grandparents migrated from Norway to Minnesota or to the Midwest. Where did they come from, Paul? Uh, Telemark, Norway. From Telemark and Deborah? Norway, Sweden, Germany. Norway, Sweden, Germany, yeah. Uh, Germany in 1754, and they told their children, only speak English when you're in public. Yeah, they told them. Jack? Ireland. From Ireland. Doors? Same. Same, from Ireland. It's amazing when you stop and think about it um, that, that the memory here is that Abraham and Sarah migrated from way up in Haran down to Hebron, huge distance in those days. But we've got the same kind of thing with our immigrant parents or grandparents, great grandparents. The boldness of to say, I'm going to leave home and go to a new land. And the whole heart of the matter is fear and dealing with fear. And you think about the enormous courage that our grandparents had. My grandfather was named uh, Ivar Tung, I-V-A-R-T-A-N-G. And he got to Philadelphia, scared stiff with a load full of, of immigrant men who didn't speak any English, getting off the board. And all they were concerned about as they went down the gangplank was to get by the, quote, the, the health officer who was watching for diseases, and especially, which, what, I, which what it was, but, but they were separating people right and left if they looked ill. So their major concern was to get by him. Um, and um, yet he had been kitted on board that he didn't want to be mean tongue. What kind of an American name is that? T -I, thinking of your tongue. So that was on his mind. So he boldly lied to that officer as he went down the gangplank. What's your name? Ivar Iverson. E -V -E -R. He thought it'd be I-V-A-R, Ivar, mm -hmm. in Norwegian. But he got by him and went by. And I heard him twice in his 80s telling that story at family reunions. And he would sit there and say, well, he said, I went down the plank. I said, my name is Ivar Iverson. And he, he wrote it on a chalkboard. And he said, like that? And he didn't know any English. He said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was his first words in America were, yeah, yeah. And he got by the health officer. And from the rest of that, we always insisted that it be Everson, not Everson. But it was um, his name from that point on. That's how we got our family name. But that's the courage, or whatever you call it, of getting off the boat in Philadelphia. Go ahead, next. Anyway, on Sundays this year, we will hear lessons from Isaiah on 27 different Sundays. But how many among us can say that we've actually read or have an understanding of the unity of the Isaiah scroll? That's my challenge and my question. What holds it together? 
And there's a lot, in, on the handout I kind of go through the literal interpretation up to about 1900, and how in the 20th century we've developed 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Isaiah, almost like there are three different books combined here, and, um, and now a new development that has happened since 1979, Brevard Childs and others, something we call canonical theology. Go ahead to the next one. In a new commentary I'm suggesting that we should read and hear the scroll from the time when it was edited into its 66 chapter format. That's the time, after all, when it becomes what we call Word of God, sacred writing. Until then, there just are memories of Isaiah and memories of his disciples and the editors, but in, in between two, 400 and 200, in the post-exilic era, this 66 chapter book got set aside I say it got frozen, that's what I told college kids anyway, frozen, set aside as sacred literature, saying you keep your grubby paws off it now, write your own Talmud, your own Gemara, your own Midrash, but freeze this for our children and our grandchildren, and Steve's got the copy here if you want to see it, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, because it's the oldest manuscript we have, all 66 chapters from about 200 BCE. And I'm suggesting that's what we ought to be using as our historical setting. The post-exilic era, when the 66 chapter book got set aside, sure, it's got lots of layers, it goes back, but they're memories that are preserved in the book of Isaiah. Next. This is my invitation, my challenge to you, to read significantly in the Isaiah curl over these next three weeks. I really hope you'll do that. Um, Isaiah was canonized between 400 and 200. Jesus clearly knew Isaiah. We think that I'm convinced Jesus in Nazareth with Mary and Joseph grew up reading the Psalms and reading Isaiah. He also knew the Torah, but, but most prominently we know from Luke 4 when he quotes Isaiah in his hometown that, that um, he refers to the Law and the Prophets. The writings were not canon yet at the time of Jesus. The Isaiah is primarily lyric poetry, and, and Steve pointed that out. What I've tried to do in, in the book is to make it, make it enjoyable and fun to read Isaiah, because I don't find it fun in the NRSV, the two columns, and it's just such massive amounts of material, and it's like they crowded everything in to get all the books of the Old Testament in there, and, and um, we lose track of the fact that Isaiah is poetry. It's wonderful lyric poetry, 2,200 years ago. Unbelievable to be reading poetry from that long ago. But, but when you see it, I tried to, I've indented it and I put it in italics so that the canonical text stands out, and then short comments. And I'm most proud of my doctor father saying that, that the short, succinct comments and juxtaposed with the biblical text is very appealing because that was certainly my goal and that's Patrick Miller at Princeton saying that, who, who picks up on that. To have short insight comments, I have tried to focus on theological insights in the text, not to get lost in all sorts of textual or historical data. Um, there's a new study coming out right now in Isaiah 40, 24 to 27, which is totally based on Babylonian and Assyrian mythology. Okay, if you can prove that, but it's all hypothetical. What I'm dealing with is the biblical text as we find it in the 66 chapter scroll. Isaiah speaks wonderfully about the grace of God years before Jesus. And that's so important in our age when we still say Old Testament law and New Testament gospel. It's just not so. Isaiah is filled with the gospel of a gracious and merciful God. And it's 200 years before Jesus. So one other thing I've done is kept all of my references to the New Testament in footnotes, to respect this as a Jewish commentary on the Torah, which it was when it was first printed. And then finally, to understand that there is a very existential summons in Isaiah, summoning people to life as servants of the Lord. And that's what I think is the heart of the, of the text. And that text in 2.5, come let us walk in the light of the Lord, that's directed at all of us not just the ancient church or the ancient Jewish community. So that in a sense, Isaiah is like a platform for Jewish-Christian dialogue as well. It's common ground. Next. Three things that you need to remember. This is just basic review. 
but did, uh, Christian people need to know some historical data, and pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic should be common terms for us. 587 to 539, if there's one date in the Old Testament we should memorize or know, 587 and 539. 587 is when, when um, Babylon destroyed Jerusalem. It, it, the exilic era begins, 587 to 539. And, and then by 539, when Cyrus of Persia comes along, amazingly, allowing the people to return to their homelands, that's the end of the Babylonian captivity. I like to, when I teach, I've always used ABC. Assyria, Babylon, Cyrus of Persia. Just to remember ABC as a background for understanding this. Isaiah lived during that Assyrian Empire in the pre-exilic pre era between 750 and 7100. Next. That's, that's, that's yeah. outstanding. I wish I would have had that. <laughs> Thank you for teaching me that one today. ABCs are simple. But now come the nude threes, and I'm suggest this is really at the heart of my book. To understand Isaiah, there are three memories that we should keep in mind. We should have them as presuppositions, like we might think about American history with the Civil War or with the Second World War or 9-11, big events. There are three memories that the, author, the people who edited Isaiah have in mind. And this is now 200, 300 years after Isaiah. This vision is alive. It's been kept by disciples. But there are three memories. One is 587, when Jerusalem was destroyed. The second one I add is the death of Nebuchadnezzar in 562. Nebuchadnezzar throughout history gets to be this evil emperor, arrogance of power, playing God in the world, and he takes over from Assyria. He's always bigger and worse and, and more tyrannical, and he's the one who destroyed Jerusalem. 562 he dies, and his sons can't hold it together. And the, the Babylonian Empire crumbles after Nebuchadnezzar dies and then 539 with Cyrus. I am suggesting that those three events give shape to the Isaiah scroll, and I'll explain in a minute. Next, go ahead. We've got memories in Isaiah, clearly. It's, they want to honor his memory, and I think it's like honoring Moses with the Torah, or Solomon with the wisdom literature, or David with the Psalms. If they want to honor Isaiah. They said this, is the, this vision was inspired by Isaiah, who lived between 750 and 700. So we've got the reference in 6.1 to the year that King Uzziah died, that Isaiah saw his vision. That's four, we've got a date there, 4.742. 8th century, remember you're working backward. 8th century BCE from 700 back to 800. Just like it's 20th century from 1900 to 2000, going the other way. You've got some references to other historical memories. Um, in chapters 7 through 9, we think they're referring to a time in between 735-34. Or most vividly, in 701, the references to Sennacherib, who attacked and literally destroyed Judah. He didn't take Jerusalem, and that will be a big thing later on. They'll think that God saved Jerusalem. Um, but but um, we've got two kings during that era. Ahaz is remembered as a very poor king, and Hezekiah is remembered as a very good king because Hezekiah was willing to pray and ask God for help. Next. What we remember about Isaiah is mainly from chapters 7, 8, and 20 that he had a wife who was known as the prophetess. He had children, Sher Yesub, Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, and possibly Emmanuel may have been a third son. That could be. He was a social critic of King Ahaz. He later was a counselor for King Hezekiah. For a time he protested the foreign policies of Judah by walking naked in Jerusalem. Chapter 20 tells that, that he was warning, this is what's going to happen to us, we're going to be slaves. They've got that vision in, or that memory in chapter 20. But the heart of the matter for me is that Isaiah focused his ministry on the welfare of the community, not on independence. He said trying to be independent from Assyria or Babylon is committing suicide. You're asking for an invasion by the empire. 
And uh, so he, he didn't encourage the kings to revolt. No, give me liberty or give me death kind of thinking. It's more the welfare of the community, which for Isaiah involves the poor and the needy and the oppressed, the orphans, the widows, and the sojourners. That that's the real heart of Isaiah's concern. Next. Say so on that, that, you know, when I hear welfare from the, in this Hebrew scripture, uh, like in Isaiah 29, welfare is it's a translation of shalom. Yes. Uh, so are you thinking of the shalom of the community? Well, if shalom in different aspects has that of welfare of the community, yeah. because shalom means well-being. Yeah. The well-being of the community. And where does work fit in? Where I say that a person that learns to fish will provide food for him and his family forever and ever. Yeah. And a person that does not learn and goes back to charity every day and brings his family back to charity and never learns, just falls apart. And in Fiddler on the Roof, you've got that famous passage where they ask the, the, the rabbi, is there a prayer for the czar? And mm -hmm. the Lord guard and keep guard and keep the czar far away from us. <laughs> and that's really what, what that's Isaiah. May, may we keep Assyria far away from us, Babylon far away from us. Pay the tribute, even if it's oppressive. Just keep the emperor away, because if he occupies yeah. your country, you're in much worse shape. Amen. And that's what happened. And now I'm talking about 400 memories from the post-exilic era. What have we learned from history? And that's the heart of this particular first presentation, is the, the prophetic view of history. It's looking back. You know that, that in Jerome, in 400, the, the, the prophetic books get moved to the end of the Old Testament because Jerome and the early church were so concerned about the idea of the prophets predicting Jesus. So you've got promise and fulfillment as a major theme. But in the Hebrew Bible, Isaiah is, comes right after the Torah. The prophets are seen as commentaries on the Torah. And I'm suggesting we can really gain a new perspective when we see them as looking backward from 400 when they were canonized. It's a, it's a theological history of 300 earlier years, Assyria, Babylon, and Cyrus of Persia. Next. Here, go back, can you go back one? Yeah. Um, we know from Isaiah 8 and from 30 that there were disciples of Isaiah. And you've got these two wonderful texts we're in frustration because the people will not hear his word. Isaiah says, bind up the testimony, seal the teaching among my disciples. We simply have to wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will hope in him. Or in 30, go write it now in a tablet, inscribe it in a book, so it may be forever for a time as a witness. For these are our rebellious people, faithless children, children who will not hear the instruction of the Lord. There's enormous sense that Isaiah was frustrated that his words of judgment and hope were not listened to by the people. And that's what sets up my title for chapters 2 and 3. I call them bitter memories because the, the, chapter 2 through 12 will be talking about Judah and Jerusalem and it's a bitter memory that the people would not listen to his word. Next. The word was preserved and expanded in the Isaiah 4055 clearly ended at, added at the end of the exilic period because it refers to Cyrus by name. Hopes for 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 Syria for 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 um, Persia and a new era of freedom and 56 again we think is in the post-exilic era after 539 when the people were back in the land. It talks about rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, and strengthening Zion. And I'm contending that Isaiah 1 to 39 as well has clearly been edited for a later audience. And so I'm suggesting academically that we should stop talking about a first Isaiah from the pre-exilic era. Because as soon as scholars talk about that, you know, Steve, that every other chapter they're talking, well, this probably was a later edition. Or at the end of this chapter, this was probably added on to. So they're already fudging and saying, well, we think we can find the authentic words of Isaiah but we have to realize that there were extensions. I'm saying let's go the other way. From the post-exilic era, let's see what they added and then remember that Isaiah is behind this. 
Next. So we've got these three big memories that I talked about. And the first one is the destruction of Jerusalem in 587. A sense of loss is over and overwhelming. If you read the Book of Lamentations, just a sense of loss is there. Jerusalem destroyed, the temple, the palace destroyed, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments are gone forever. We have no idea what happened. And the king and many people were deported to Babylon as slavings. So we've got this overwhelming sense of loss, the memory of the exile from 400. I mean, it's 580, 587, 187 years earlier, but it's still looming, kind of like Vietnam hangs over America. Mm -hmm. We aren't sure what to say about that kind of memory. And, and the era of the exile, the Babylonian captivity, is a vivid memory for the post-exilic community. How could God allow that? If, if it's the city of David and if God is the center of Jerusalem, how could he allow the city to be destroyed? And that's what I want to go up to in, in, in the first section of Isaiah. Go ahead, next. And the second one is the death of Nebuchadnezzar, the fall of Babylon. Babylon was conquered Assyria in 612 and dominated just for a lifetime, really, 612 to 539. After the death of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylon declines and falls to Cyrus in 539. Okay, 72 years for the Babylonian Empire, but it was tyrannical and overwhelmingly brute force. Okay? And the third memory of Cyrus and the Persian Empire, a benevolent policy, whenever he conquered cities, he allowed captive people to return home, as long as they pledged allegiance to Persia. Sometimes I'm very cynical about this, I think it was just very shrewd foreign policy by, by Persia. He was a brutal dictator, he was a military marvel all over, he went all the way to the Indian border with India, conquering cities. But he had that benevolent idea that wherever there were, wherever there were deported peoples, he allowed them to return to their homelands, provided they pledged allegiance to him, <laughs> shrewd, and they did. But for that one aspect of allowing the captive people in Babylon to return home, they see that as reflecting God's will for freedom and for freedom of movement and for identity, and, and for that they will honor Cyrus mightily in Isaiah 44 and 45. Next, I'm suggesting, and this is what I've said, the thesis, and try to discover what Isaiah said, the historical Isaiah. I'm not that interested in that, as I am that we should hear the words with the second temple who remember and preserve his writings. The three memories, what are they? 587, 562, 539. Okay, next. And the superscription of Isaiah really sets the whole point, the vision that Isaiah saw. So the memories of his, his warnings are there, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the widow, the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. There's no question, that's the message of Isaiah set out in the introduction. But think about in, in the post-exilic era, after what you've learned from the fall of Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity, and now with this new chapter of life with Cyrus, this is the word to the people. This is the word of Isaiah, okay? Sir, is this, is yes. this just the southern kingdom we're talking about? Excuse me, a southern kingdom, okay. Judah. Israel's gone, Nor northern kingdom is gone in 722. The Assyrians wiped them out, yes. After you were done answering? Yeah. Me. Okay. Um, I, I see during the time of Isaiah, there was a lot of conquering and killing between nations. War and, all over the place. Ugliness, and the Lord was angered. And then we have the teachings of Isaiah, and as we look at the facts of today, we still see the warring and the anger. So I, I don't see, we go back to the other slide, I don't see the impact of the previous slide on the world today. Yeah. Now I know that poverty in the world has declined. I, I see no other. No. I, don't so know what that I don't think it's any more optimistic today than it was. War is a horror and, and yet the prophet has a two-sided view. He wants to say somehow God is involved in the world mm -hmm. because he wants God to be the source of all energy. 
God is the source of human energy for Babylon, for Adolf Hitler, for any evil man, and God is also the source of energy for Cyrus and for Martin Luther King and for others. And the question is, how do you use your energy? How are you going to use it? And he wants to say, in some places, because of the troubles in Judah, God was using Assyria or Babylon as an instrument of punishment. We'll get to that in a moment, because that's, that's one prophetic view that God is involved in everything, but he can turn around and say, but the emperor doesn't see it that way. He thinks he's God. He can, uh -huh. thinks he can do anything he wants. Okay, but this one, let's go ahead now to the next one. This is a chapter, wait a minute, chapter 2 through 12 has the inscription, the word that Isaiah, a son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And one thing that I'm doing in the book that's kind of new, I haven't seen it in commentaries, I'm suggesting what that presupposes is the fall of Jerusalem. From 400, if you're going to write a superscription for a section of Isaiah and say this is the word concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the most significant thing is that Judah and Jerusalem were destroyed by Babylon. How come? How did that happen? And I will suggest, that's why I call it, that these are bitter memories of Judah and Jerusalem in chapters 2 through 12, when you read that. There, it's filled with encouragement and words of hope as well, but right in the heart of it are some very sad memories. Go to the next one. The, one tech, the first text that I want to look at of two or three in this session is simply the, the vineyard. What a beautiful parable it is, but it's frightening because it begins, and I think here I'm going out looking at some vineyards in Santa Barbara or the area, beautiful vineyards given all sorts of love and care. Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones, planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the middle of it because at harvest time you've got to stay out there at night because of thieves and robbers. So you guard it, you sit in your watchtower at night, maybe have a party, but you watch your vineyard to let those grapes get ripe. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem, judge between me. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I've not done? I expected it to yield wonderful, rich, ripe grapes. Why did it produce wild grapes? That's, this is the bitter memory about Judah, is that they were short-sighted, they were arrogant, they were selfish, they did stupid things like revolting against the empire to bring military retaliation. Mm. Now I'll tell you what I have to do with that vineyard. What do you do with a vineyard that produces bitter grapes? It's just a logical question. Turn it over. I have to remove its hedge and it will be devoured. Go ahead. I will break down its wall, it will be trampled, I'll make it a waste, shall not be pruned or hoed, it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the rains that no rain come upon it. This is creator of heaven and earth talking. For the vineyard of the Lord, and he gives the explanation now, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts was the house of Israel. The people of Judah, pleasant panting. He expected justice. He expected But he saw bloodshed. He, he wanted righteousness, but he saw wickedness, self-centeredness. Mainly the rulers thinking about themselves rather than the welfare of people. And it's compounded by the little passage in chapter 1, which I think is a bitter memory. And again, think of it from 400, from the post-exilic era. Your country lies desolate, your cities burned by fire. In your presence, aliens devour your land. It is desolate, it is overthrown by foreigners. Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a shelter in a cucumber city, uh, like a besieged city. And that wonderful, this passage from the post-exilic era, the survivors who come back to Jerusalem, if the Lord had not left us a few survivors, we would all have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. That's pretty bitter. I don't deal with chapter 2, which is a huge Day of the Lord poem in First Isaiah in chapters 2 to 12, but that as well is really thinking bitter memories about Judah and Jerusalem and explaining it that God brought judgment upon them for their misconduct. That's prophetic understanding of history, is that uh, sooner or later 
arrogance and, and uh, unrighteous conduct, either by empire or by Judah itself, is going to bring a price. Okay, next. The second memory, the second, I'm dealing with the superscriptions, because I think the superscriptions are added by the later editors to organize the book. And in chapter 13, you've got a second superscription. Could you define superscription? What? Could you define superscription? Well, it's the oracle concerning Babylon that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. That's the superscription. And I think it's added by an editor to organize the book. So it's an, it, there are three of them. There's one in 1-1, one, one, there's one in 2-1, one, and now this one in 13-1. Editorial labels what's for a oracle, section. What's oracle what? What's oracle? What does oracle mean? Oracle? It's, you know, what does that mean? The oracle? Yeah. I don't know, because it's a kind of a difficult word in Hebrew. It's um, um, it actually, a word that is lifted up. Masah. And I've seen a dissertation written on the word Masah, which is oracle. It's just simply an utterance or a statement. Mm. And somebody has said that this is the the statement concerning Babylon that Isaiah saw, and it seems to introduce the next section of Isaiah, so that 2 through 12 is an opening section. And it's interesting that chapter 12 ends with a doxology. It's kind of like, blessed be these memories for good or for ill, in chapters 2 through 12. But now here is a second section of Isaiah, and I call it bitter memories of Judah among the nations. Historically, people talked about 13 through 23, as being Isaiah's address to the nations. But the problem is that there's, in chapter 22, there's a beautiful, powerful statement about Judah right in the middle of, of first Isaiah. So um, it doesn't make sense. It, it isn't accurate to just call it oracles against foreign nations. Nebuchadnezzar built an amazing empire that brought down Assyria. He died in 562. His empire fell apart under his sons and then fell to Persia by 539. 587, 562, 539. Keep them in mind as you read Isaiah. I think it brings it alive from the post-exilic era. Next. And here the heart of it is dealing with Babylon. You ain't God. That's what it's really saying about human beings. You may think you're God, you may play God. The more powerful you get as a leader, president, dictator, whatever it might be, be careful about playing God because you're a human being. Kings, emperors may play God, but they are mortals. Whether it be the pharaoh in Egypt, Sennacherib of East Syria, or current leaders or dictators, arrogance of power is seen as the chronic illness of people in power. It's almost like the more powerful they get, the more they think they can do whatever they want. And uh, that's going to be a judgment on Babylon it starts already with Assyria, the memory in chapter 10. Let's look at it. This to me is one of my favorite passages because it's just talking about human leaders and how arrogant they can get. Um, the prophet speaks using the power of Assyria to punish a godless nation. So God can use them as a tool. They're an instrument of God because they're children of God. The empire, the whole world is children of God. There's a universalism that way. But Assyria doesn't understand it that way. And he, he says that they're being used by God, but this is not what the emperor intends, or what he has in mind. It's in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. He, and then he lists all the nations he's already destroyed, one after another, cities that he's laid waste. Look how great I am. And then the prophet says, when the Lord has finished his work on Mount Zion, he will, publish, he will punish, not publish, punish the arrogant boasting of the king of Assyria and his haughty pride. For the emperor says, by the strength of my hand I have done it. By my wisdom I have understanding. Go ahead. My hand is found like a nest, and I love this because I used to pick up eggs from chickens, and the, we had chickens on the farm. And going down there and kind of getting under the hen, and she'd be very upset with you as you take her eggs away from her. But this is the image that's used. My hand is found like a nest, the wealth of peoples, as one gathers eggs that have been forsaken. So I have gathered all the earth, and there's none that moved a wing. 
or opened his mouth or chirped. I could do whatever I wanted to. Gold, silver, whatever it is, I can go and get it. Might makes right. The prophet does not know when, but he is certain that a day of judgment, the day of the Lord, which is a rhetoric in the poetry, the time of judgment will come for the arrogant powers on earth. It came for Nebuchadnezzar, and he was unloved by future generations. That's, I think, what you realize. Name for me a, a tyrant emperor who is loved in history. Maybe Napoleon, but I can't, I've never figured that out, how, how empires get loved by later generations. Then in Isaiah, after 13 through 35, you've got three chapters which are kind of devoted to memories of Hezekiah. And it's kind of a whitewash because Hezekiah is painted as a very good king because you've got three prayers of Hezekiah that are very moving. We aren't sure that was actually the historical case, but in memory they want to paint Hezekiah as a good king, a model for later generations. Cyrus comes. And the memories undergird the message of hope throughout the book of Isaiah. That's why we've got so many texts from Isaiah, because they see God's redemptive presence in history. God doesn't leave the world like that. And you get that whole notion of the redemptive arc of history that Martin Luther King talked about, the belief that sooner or later, goodness will, preserve, will prevail over wickedness, truth over falsehood, beauty over horror, and I guess I believe that. I really do. I have hopes for the world that ultimately righteousness and, and goodness preserve, prevail. I mean, and we see education throughout the world. Our dilemma is that with the internet, we're aware of Afghanistan and, and Libya and Yemen and countries we never used to think about. We've got a global perspective now, and yet I hope that, that education and and goodness can prevail in the world over evil. I really, I just have that deep kind of biblical hope in my life, but it certainly gets tested at times. <laughs> the Lord God of Israel is Lord over all creation and kingdoms, that good triumphs over evil, triumph, tr good freedom over captivity, and through Cyrus, God redeems people and restores a community. Next. So that we get to Isaiah, and here's where you get this wonderful section of Isaiah, which is a whole gospel of hope and comfort. And those of us who know the Messiah have learned so many different texts from Isaiah. Comfort, comfort me, my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. This is after Cyrus. It's all related to the Persian era, when you've got hope to return to your country, hope that, that you can rebuild your country, and all these texts have that background on them, uh, the sweet memories in Isaiah. Comfort my people, um, that her penalty is paid, she has received double for her hand. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight a desert for our God. Next. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain be made low, the uneven shall become level, the rough places a plain. The glory of the Lord shall be repealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is poetry that is ingrained in many of us who've lived in the church. We've heard these texts, and, and this is the good news that is all associated with the memory of that era of Cyrus of Persia. 300 years, 700 down to 400, the formation of the Isaiah scroll, when it's set apart. And it's set apart because it's affirming the goodness of God. My invitation to you in these three weeks is to look at Isaiah 1 and 2 through 12 that preserve these bitter memories of Judah before 587. Isaiah's warnings came to pass as Jerusalem was destroyed. 13 through 35 present memories of warfare among the nations and they want to affirm Yahweh's lordship over all nations. And it's again and again, arrogance of power or short-sighted activity on the part of Moab or Edom or any other country. They're all countries that are under the lordship of God. For our session next week, I want to challenge you to read in Isaiah 40 to 45. You can read 40 to 48, but to read 40 to 45, God, the Lord is redeemer of his people, redeemer of the world. God's redemptive activity. And I really believe that my book can help you read. It's got the text and, and to read short comments to hold your attention um, as to what the text is saying. 
Um, and for our third session, then, I'll look at the traditions of the servant of the Lord and the Messiah tradition in Isaiah. That'll be the third one. Okay, let me finish with a couple of comments here. At the end of chapter 2 through 12, the bitter memories, you still have a doxology. At, at the end of 2 through 12, even though there are bitter memories of Judah and Jerusalem, the author can say, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. And surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. Go ahead. And this is a blessing on the past in chapter 32 as well. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make no his deeds known among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praise to the Lord for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. That's the way chapters 2 through 12, the bitter memories end. So it isn't bitter at all. It's saying, yeah, we've got painful things to think about, but this is the word to you, that you've got a new chapter of life and you're there now and, and you should praise God with your life and be a servant of the Lord. That's the way, so that's the first section, 2 through 12. The second section, 13 through 35, he broadens it out and talks about Judah's struggles among the nations of the world. And then go ahead, next. And the concluding passage that I think is almost my favorite in the whole book uh, that I'll conclude with today is in Isaiah 61. And I will get to this when we come back to the tradition of the servant of the Lord. Servant of the Lord is not just Jesus. This is not just prediction of Jesus in a literal way. It's a tradition that begins with Moses to be the servant of the Lord. And it runs through the biblical tradition as a tradition of what people of faith ought to be like. And from, from the, the New, New Testament community clearly saw Jesus as the epitome of the servant of the Lord. Par excellence, God's son. I, I get troubled sometimes when we say his only son because it's not what the biblical tradition says. The servant of the Lord is to be there as a role model, like a good king or a good leader or a good person of faith. And Paul sees himself as a servant of the Lord. And then Paul talks about the church as the body of Christ, the servant of the Lord in the world. But this chapter is just such an epitome. It isn't just about one person. It's the picture of what a servant of the Lord is like. And there's some imagery here that I think is just fantastic. Um, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoner, and then to comfort those who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, and to give them garlands instead of ashes. What a wonderful image that is. Um, in another place, in Isaiah 30, the prophet writes, This is rest. Give rest to the weary. If you want to find rest in the world, find somebody to give rest to it. Find somebody else to help. And that will bring alive the whole notion of peace and rest or shalom in the world. To give them garlands instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, go ahead, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they shall be called oaks of righteousness. We in Thousand Oaks love our oaks. <laughs> the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. You can see why I think this is like a foundation between Jews and Jewish and Christian thought. This is a text that can be discussed and, because this is Jewish literature, but it's also foundational for us as we think of the message of the early church. So that the heart of the Isaiah scroll stands alive, come. Let us walk in the way of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you.